Let's get started. First of all, a very warm welcome to everybody joining us today for our annual case law update. Um, we're going to try and make this session a bit seasonal. I think probably um, Rob has done the best job of, of doing that. Um, I'm going to have to add a little bit of seasonal cheer into what I'm saying as we're going along. Uh, but by way of introductions, I'm Andrew Spencer. I'll be going first this morning and um, I'll be talking for about 15 minutes or so uh, giving a uh, case law update on cases from the travel law world. Then um, next is going to be um, Rob Horner, who's going to give a personal injury update. And then uh, last but absolutely not least, Abigail Stamp, who's going to be giving the clinical negligence update. Um, please do um, feel free to ask questions, to put things in the chat. Um, we'll try and answer all of the questions which are in the ask questions section. Um, so I think at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A section. So uh, if you have a question as we're going along, then please do put it in there and we'll try and answer it as we go along. But realistically, we probably won't be able to answer them while we're talking ourselves. Uh, we've also got a chat function. Please do use the chat. Um, if you have a question, it's best to put it in the Q&A rather than the chat because we won't necessarily be able to respond to everything in the chat. But um, from past experience, it's normally a good place for, for putting things in and discussion points and so forth. Um, I'm going to be doing the uh, Chris Whitty job today. If it's not too triggering to everybody to be reminded of those uh, horrible times, I suppose we're being reminded on them all the time with the COVID inquiry at the moment, which means I'm, I've got um, control of the PowerPoint, which is great for me, maybe a bit less great for Rob and Abigail, but... Uh, Apologies in advance if that's a bit clunky. I will be doing my best. Well, without further ado, um, I will get started with the um, with the travel law uh, update. If I can um, move this through to the next um, to the next screen, bear with me a moment. Well. Here we are. So, uh, yes, now I've uh, made the technology work. Uh, the travel law case roundup. As I say, my concession to seasonality is having a bit of holly at the top of the page. But um, seeing how festive and jolly Rob's slides are, um, maybe I need to come up with some sort of tagline for some of these. Well, let it snow would be quite good for two of these cases. Um, the Ryanair case about ICE airlines and accidents, and also the Sherman case about package travel regulations. Uh, I haven't thought of any festive taglines for the Spanish penalty interest case, or indeed COVID refunds, or Griffiths. But, um, well, Griffiths could be the ghost of Christmas past because we've talked about it at uh, previous webinars. In fact, as is the case for the Spanish penalty interest matters. But if I think of any more seasonal uh, monikers for these, then I'll let you know as we're going along or put them through in the chat if you have some good ideas. Well, moving on to the first case uh, then, this is about Spanish penalty interest. So as um, per previous webinars, we've had a debate for some time now about um, how Spanish interest should be treated by the English courts. And the reason for this is that if you have a case that's governed by Spanish law being litigated here, um, the Spanish um, uh, law in inverted commas has um, quite um, an interesting and um, for defendants potentially expensive interest provision, which provides for interest at a very high uh, rate where the defendant hasn't made an early offer in settlement. And the awards for this penalty interest can be very significant indeed. And in, in some of the cases, they actually serve to double the amount of the award. So given how significant these penalty interests can be, um, understandably, there's um, been quite a lot of squabble between the parties about whether or not the courts should award uh, Spanish penalty interest or not. And the debate that's um, been happening is whether this is a procedural matter, in which case a matter for the court of the forum, so for the English courts, or whether it's substantive, because if it's substantive, then uh, the English courts are required to apply it as a matter of Spanish law. 
So previous cases on this issue include Trope, which I put in there, which is a decision of a High Court judge on appeal, and also Sedgwick. The other issue that arises is that if Spanish penalty interest is procedural, should the court uh, award it in any event as a matter of discretion under Section 35A of the Supreme Court Act? And indeed, that's the result that's happened in a number of these earlier cases. So the court said that this is not substantive, it's in fact procedural, but actually, as a matter of discretion, it's appropriate to award uh, interest at the Spanish penalty rate, um, rather than the much lower um, rates usually applied in England and Wales. And what's happened this year is that we've got another judgment on appeal in this. So this is from Mr Justice Martin Spencer, uh, no relation, who has considered um, uh, Nichols on appeal. Well, um, as I've said, the result below was that it was held that Spanish penalty interest was procedural, not substantive, but it was awarded as a matter of discretion. And um, what Mr Justice Martin Spencer has done is essentially upheld the result from below, which is to say he has upheld the award of Spanish penalty interest, but basically reversed the reasoning. So his reasoning is, that um, it's wrong to say that Spanish penalty interest is procedural. It is, in fact, substantive, which means that um, the court has to award it when dealing with a Spanish case uh, in this jurisdiction. He's gone on to say, for good measure, that if he was wrong about that, and if it were procedural, then courts down below have been wrong to award it as a matter of discretion. And the reason for that is um, he's identified that there is a very different, what he's described as a procedural environment in England and Wales to Spain, where very different procedural rules, and indeed England and Wales has its own rules and sanctions and incentives to encourage early offers and early settlements, notably Part 36, which was um, featured in one of the earlier cases. So it's really a reversal. He's applied Spanish penalty interest but because it's substantive, not procedural, and said that if it were procedural, then it wouldn't be appropriate to allow it. So the same result, different reasons. And that leaves this in a real state of flux, because we now have two uh, completely inconsistent High Court decisions on appeal. We've got the first case of Troke, and then we've got this one, Nichols. And um, in Nichols, Mr Justice Martin Spencer discusses Troke and explains why he thinks that's wrong. So there's a lot of inconsistency in the law here. And um, I understand that um, the Nichols decision is going to the Court of Appeal, and that's being heard in May. So there's going to be a high element of watch this space uh, about what happens to this next. As I say, currently two inconsistent High Court decisions on appeal, but this is going to be considered by the Court of Appeal in spring next year. So we may well find that this uh, or features in the festive uh, webinar next year as well. Well, I'm going to move on to a more festive case, perhaps, at least one that involves ice. And um, sorry, I've gone too far forward there. Um, and this is the case of Arthur and Ryanair. And um, the reason why I've included this case is because it's about um, the definition of an accident for the purposes of a claim of the Montreal Convention. Now, the facts of this case are that um, there had been extremely inclement weather and uh, a plane, while sitting on the uh, apron, had required to be de-iced. And this meant that de-icing fluid had been sprayed all over the plane. Quite a lot of it had gone onto the floor, as had other uh, moisture and ice and so forth. The, um, this evidently was an airport without an air bridge, so the uh, passengers walked on the floor outside over the ice and over the de-icing fluid and then into the plane. And the result of that was that passengers walked in um, liquid, that's to say, uh, water, ice, de-icing fluid from the outside into the cabin. And the question was whether someone who then slipped on this uh, fluid had suffered an accident or not. And um, the way that this is described is uh, knowing that this was an icy day where the floor was wet, where the aeroplane was de-iced on the tarmac before the passengers walked across the tarmac to board the aeroplane. Um, 
it was held that the reasonable passenger with ordinary experience of commercial air travel would not, in my judgment, find the presence of such fluid on the floor close to where people enter the airplane to be unusual or unexpected. The fact that the claimant says there was quite a lot of it doesn't seem to me to make any difference, given that whilst Mr. Arthur was not sure how many passengers there were on the flight, he certainly gave the impression that it was quite a number rather than just a handful. So what happened here is that the judge found that in inclement weather, um, the presence of um, water or de-icing fluid on the cabin floor having been walked in from outside was something usual, something to be expected by uh, ordinary passengers. And this meant that somebody slipping on that wasn't unusual or unexpected, and therefore not an accident. And that decision was uh, upheld on appeal. Well, uh, that might be as festive uh, as it gets. Um, the uh, next decision is all about um, COVID refunds. So this is quite an interesting case. Um, it's a case from the CJEU uh, interpreting the directive on which our package travel regulations are based. And um, it's all about uh, COVID refunds, as I say, so quite a hot uh, topic. And the facts of this case are quite striking. I've put them on the screen here. The claimant bought a package holiday to Gran Canaria, de uh, departing in March 2020. Um, notice the date. Uh, two days after arriving, there was basically a lockdown in Spain. Beaches were closed, a curfew was brought in, and guests were kept in their rooms except to leave to eat. The um, claimant had a two-week holiday and was sent home a week early. And the claimants contended that there was a lack of conformity with the holiday contract and that they were entitled to um, a partial refund. And the uh, claimants uh, sought 70% reduction for um, essentially not having the holiday that they wanted to have. And as I say, this is all a decision on the directive, but our own package travel regulations follows the wording from the directive and the equivalent uh, in our regulations would be regulation 16. So uh, regulation 16.2 says, the organiser must offer the traveller an appropriate price reduction for any period during which there's a lack of conformity, that's to say a lack of conformity with the holiday contract, unless the organiser proves that the lack of conformity is attributable to the traveller. So the claimant's case was there was a lack of conformity, it's not attributable to me, the traveller, and we're entitled to compensation for it. And the defendant resisted that, saying that the, this has all happened because of the COVID emergency, that other countries around the world, including from the claimant's place of origin, had all introduced similar sorts of restrictions, and also that this was unavoidable in extraordinary circumstances. And the CJEU considered all of this and um, found for the claimant. And the reason is um, the way that the uh, rules and entitlement to refunds and compensation is structured. So where there is a lack of conformity, Regulation 16.2 and the equivalent provisions of the directive say that the traveller is entitled to an appropriate price reduction unless the lack of conformity is attributable to the traveller, which it wasn't. There's no other um, section that provides some kind of um, get out of paying compensation card to the tour operator. And that's different to the section about compensation. And in our regulation, uh, 16.3, there is a separate provision for compensation uh, for any damage suffered by reason of the lack of conformity. So we've got a price reduction and then we've got compensation and they're different sections, different rules apply to them. And it's only the compensation where um, there is the defence of unavoidable and extraordinary circumstances. So unavoidable and, ex and extraordinary circumstances, if made out, would be a reason to deny the claimant's compensation, but that is not a defence to a claim for a price reduction. And so the results of this decision is that the claimants were entitled to uh, a, a partial refund in respect of the lack of conformity with the, uh, with the contract. 
And this seems um, to me to be a decision which very much follows the way that this has been drafted, that the uh, price reduction and the, um, and the compensation sections are distinct and um, defence applies to one that doesn't apply in the other, which is exactly what CJU has found here. And it's uh, interesting to bear that in mind when we look at the next case. So this is Sherman and Reader Offers Limited. Perhaps this is uh, seasonal. Uh, it involves ice. Um, it involves inclement weather uh, in the Northwest Passage, no less. And now this is actually not a case about the 2018 regulations. It's a case about the 1992 package travel regulations, um, just because of uh, how long ago the holiday was. The facts of this case are quite unusual. The claimant um, was recommended to the tour operator and had fancied going on a, a Northwest Passage cruise and booked quite an expensive cruise over the telephone without having seen a brochure or indeed any advert. At the time that he booked, he was provided with quite a basic itinerary. And then later on, he was provided with a more detailed itinerary, setting out various stops in Greenland and in the Northwest Passage. Unfortunately, um, there was too much ice in the Northwest Passage. The expected ice breakup didn't happen at the time it was expected to. It was much later. And the result of this was that the itinerary couldn't be followed and indeed much of it had to be abandoned. So um, the claimant was unhappy about this and uh, brought a claim for damages. And um, there were a number of issues here, but the first one was which was the relevant itinerary for considering whether or not the contract had been complied with. And the claimant argued the relevant itinerary was the more detailed one provided later. And at first instance, the judge held that that was wrong. It was the basic itinerary because that was the one which was the basis of the booking. And the contract couldn't be by post-contractual document, uh, didn't vary the contracts and so forth. However, the change that had been made was such as to be a uh, post-departure alteration, not alternation, under Regulation 14, meaning that compensation was payable if appropriate. However, the judge held that compensation wasn't appropriate. And the reason he held that was because the judge found that the defence in Regulation 15.2c uh, two of the 1992 regs was made out. That's to say, an event which the other party to the contract or the supplier of services, even with all due care, could not foresee or forestall. Um, so the result of that was that the claimant lost. The claimant, however, appealed, and the appeal um, was heard, and the result of it came out uh, earlier this year. And um, the uh, the appeal really reverses the decision of the judge on the basis of lots of the particular issues. Now, the judge on appeal held that the, uh, it was the detailed itinerary and not the basic itinerary that was the relevant one. And the judge's reason for that is she considered that the basic itinerary didn't actually comply with the requirements of the uh, package travel regulations. And although the package travel, travel regulations do not say that there's no contract until there's the more detailed itinerary. The judge held that that was the position. And that meant that um, there was potentially a lot more lack of conformity with the contract if the contract's based on the more detailed itinerary. The judge also said that the claimant might not have actually been bound by the contract until the detailed itinerary was provided. Um, the judge went on to find that the detailed itinerary was an essential term of the contract. And when that uh, wasn't going to be provided, it was a major change that the claimant needs to be notified of in good time. And that's uh, Regulation 12 uh, under the heading Significant Alteration to Essential Terms. So the judge held that um, the claimant hadn't been notified of a significant change in good time and that that was a breach. And then finally, with a good measure, the judge held that the uh, defence in Regulation 15 wasn't made out. This wasn't an event which could not be foreseen or stalled even with all due care. And the reason she found that is the question of foreseeability. Uh, whilst it was the case that 
the ice had broken up much later than in previous years. Um, the judge considered that ice in the Northwest Passage was something that was entirely foreseeable. Indeed, that's why the defendant monitored it quite carefully. So that um, defence wasn't made out. And um, there's quite a lot that can be said about this decision. So can it really be right that um, when the contract's formed depends on when the detailed itinerary is provided? If that's right, would that mean that the other party to the contract could have pulled out at any time until the detailed itinerary was provided? That would be a surprising result, uh, an unattractive result, pretty unsatisfactory result. Um, also, the judge has um, fettered together or brought together Regulation 14, which says compensation and less inappropriate, and linked it to the defences in Regulation 15, essentially read over the defence. Is that the right thing to do? And indeed, um, the judge has reached a different decision on foreseeability based on the same expert evidence that the judge had before about whether or not that could have been foreseen. So there are lots of uh, issues that loose ends, as it were, that arise out of this. Um, it does occur to me that this would be considered in a, a bit of a different way if we were looking at um, something under the 2018 uh, regulations. And um, just following on from the KT case, um, I suppose the position there would be that uh, on the basis of terms of the contract as found by the judge, then there was a lack of conformity and um, that wasn't the fault of the uh, passenger, meaning that there'd be the entitlement to a refund. Um, whether or not there'd be the entitlement to a compensation as well as a partial refund, would depend on whether it was unavoidable or extraordinary circumstances. So obviously a slightly different test to the one in Regulation 15 of the old regulations. But really on the basis of the finding on appeal, um, perhaps the judge wouldn't have found it was um, extraordinary circumstances, even though they were unavoidable circumstances. Well, um, I can see that I'm uh, overrunning a bit from my time now. So I'm, my, the last thing I was just going to refer to is my, and finally, was Griffiths and um, Chewy. And um, I'm sure everybody's very familiar with this case. Um, this is, again, a case that's been going on for quite some time, all about how courts should treat expert evidence. By way of a quick reminder, the uh, underlying case is a, a holiday gastric illness case. It was allocated to the multi-track the defendant had permission for its own expert evidence on causation, but elected not to um, obtain or at least to serve or rely on it. The claimant's expert supported the case. He wasn't called to give evidence at the trial. The evidential basis of the expert evidence wasn't challenged, uh, meaning that the evidence was uncontroverted. So nothing had been put in to challenge either the evidential basis or the reasoning of the report. But in closing submissions, the defendant put on a, a, a full-blooded challenge to the expert report and contended that the reasoning was inadequate to prove the claim. And first instance, the judge agreed with that and dismissed the claim. This then uh, went to a High Court judge on appeal. Again, that was Mr Justice Martin Spencer. And he reversed that decision and held that the judge should have accepted the evidence because it was uncontroverted. Um, this then went to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal over, overrode Mr. Justice Martin Spencer, saying that there wasn't anything impermissible about challenging a report for the first time in closing, although said that that would be a high risk approach. And from the Court of Appeal decision, the onus was really on the claimant to have fully reasoned expert evidence which the judge would accept. However, in the Court of Appeal, um, Lord Justice Bean was in a very powerful dissent saying that failing to challenge this evidence and then criticising it in closing amounted to trial by ambush and actually made the trial unfair. And as you can see from the slide, as you may well know, I'm sure you know anyway, the Supreme Court has agreed with Lord Justice B. So what that means is expert evidence, like other evidence, needs to be properly challenged if it's to be criticised in closing submissions. This is a question of fairness the witness or the expert witness needs to have had the criticisms put to them so that they can then respond to them. Now, it was said by the defendant 
that this would be most undesirable because experts would need to be called in all sorts of cases, uh, including uh, lower value ones where it would be proportionate. And the Supreme Court say that that's not necessarily the case, that uh, focused part 35 questions may be sufficient. And um, I think that's going to be where the battleground is going to uh, lie here. Um, if you're wanting to challenge evidence, you're going to have to have some sort of challenge to controvert it. It may be that you can challenge the evidential basis of, the, um, of a report, but as a defendant, it would be necessary to make sure that a witness has considered the alternative possible factual scenarios. So it may be a case of putting questions to the witness to say, well, if the court finds that this happened, what's your evidence at that stage? Um, but part of 35 questions is going to have to be a lot more specific and focused in future if experts aren't going to be called. And indeed, if it's a lower value case where the expert would normally be called, it's going to be necessary to ask the questions first and then to say to the judge that the answers aren't satisfactory and therefore uh, the witness needs to be called. Well, um, that is it for me for the time being. So I'm going to hand you over to Rob and do my best with the, with the Chris Whitty thing in the meantime. Good afternoon, all. I'm here to talk for the next 15 minutes or so on uh, notable cases from 2023 dealing with personal injury. And I have tried to keep it festive. So we're going to be looking at, Andrew can have my next slide, thank you, there we are. Fairground rights, alcoholic drinks, those less fortunate than ourselves, Iceland and Latvia. So we go to our next slide and we'll start with a fairground ride. Um, and we'll enjoy the High Court as they try and describe the fun one can have at the fair. Facts of this case, James against Shaw. Um, claimant was a worker on a fairground, sued the fairground operator because he stood on a railing trying to undo a bolt on one of the rides, slipped and injured. And we had your usual arguments, claimant saying unsafe system of work, defendant arguing all reasonable steps taken and a complete conflict of account. Can I read you paragraph five of the judgment, which is Mr. Justice Cook describing the ride. The ride's an A-frame with pendulum and the pendulum has four cars at the base, each of which can carry four seated passengers. When in operation, the pendulum swings from side to side and the cars rotate, giving the occupants a thrilling experience. I think he's really captured the fun of the fair there, hasn't he? Anyway, two points of interest for us in this decision, I think. First of all is how the judge dealt with this conflict of account between the claimant and the defendant. And he helpfully sets out the difficulty of that. He called it a complex and multifaceted task. Some people can lie extremely convincingly and fluently. Some people are unsure and hesitant but are telling the truth. Um, and an account supported by independent or contemporary evidence may be more reliable. Well, at the end of the day, the court accepted the claimant's account and accepted the claimant's account next because the account in the witness statement that the claimant provided accorded with the account in the Amulet's record. So what was said from the word go had been said throughout and the account had an inherent credibility to it. It made sense. I think of particular interest, though, is why the judge didn't prefer the defendant account. And the first thing the judge said is because it was inherently implausible. There was no reason why a claimant would be standing on a railing as he was with a spanner in his hand as he was, unless he'd been asked to. And that's a common argument, isn't it? Whether you're for claimant or defendant that is often raised is that the claimant did it off his own bat, a frolic of his own. Whereas in this case, the judge said, well, no, why would he do it on his own? Second point I think was interesting is that the defendant was not particularly caring of the claimant after the incident. And the judge noted that that wasn't particularly consistent with a conscientious employer. And the defendant's case was that they were conscientious. And then the third thing was the defendant's case was that um, the spanner that the claimant said he was using and said he was asked to use was the wrong tool. And the court says if the defendant was seriously going to maintain that, they'd need to produce evidence to show why it was the wrong tool, as opposed to what they said was the right tool. And when giving evidence as the defendant started to nuance his case a little, that didn't impress the court. 
So I guess the point to take home from that is sense check your account, whichever side you're on, does it make sense? And then evidence check your account. If you're asserting something, have you produced evidence that will be readily available to prove it? And finally, as always, consistency is king. Second point to note from this authority is that of contributory negligence. Uh, it was accepted that there is a general duty on employees to take care of themselves. But in this case, the claimant had no formal health and safety training. What he'd learned, he'd learned on the job from the defendant. And um, the claimant was doing that task, the court found, because the employer had one asked him so to do. And two, there was another representative from the defendant in company of the claimant at the time. So no deduction for contributory negligence. I think for those of us who represent claimants predominantly, that's helpful because for many cases, for good reason, we'll often take somewhat of a deduction, perhaps 20% or so, to resolve liability when a claimant's doing something that's self-evidently risky. Well, this case might be a helpful pushback on that if the claimant's merely doing what he's been told and what everyone else does in the manner shown, even if it was obviously risky. That being said, I, I do feel a little that um, the claimant had a good result in this case. Let's move on to a glass of something bubbly, spilled on the floor, causing someone to slip and injure their ankle. In APRE, the facts are these. It was summer's night, late in the evening, claimant slipped on a spilt drink close to the bar. The defendant gave their evidence that, look, we have staff who are going around collecting glasses at least every 10 to 15 minutes. And as they go around, they check the floor to make sure that there's nothing untoward there. Now, there's no specific interval for inspections and there's no formal recording of inspection. But the staff are trained what to do if they find a drink and how to clear it up. Now, at court first instance, it was held that actually the system of inspection, although accepted factually, was not sufficient. Spillages were likely to happen close to the bar. It was dark, it was busy, it was a wooden floor, so likely to be slippery when wet. And there was no documentation of when the actual inspections had taken place. So found in favour of the claimant. The matter was appealed. And the Court of Appeal noted that the direct and detailed evidence given by the defendant of their system of inspection, that there was in fact inspections at least every 10 to 15 minutes had been accepted at first instance. And they said that having regard to the realities of running a late night bar, the system was sufficient. It was a proactive system, not reactive. It also said, look, spilt drinks, they're not an unknown phenomena, and most customers are aware of the risk, and you cannot reasonably prevent the risk arising. The court said, look, reasonable care had been taken, and so the claim failed. The reason I include that is it's, I think, quite a helpful case for spillages in areas open to the public, of reminding us that the occupier's liability imposes a duty on occupiers to take reasonable care to ensure that the visitors are reasonably safe in the reasonable world. It's not a standard of perfection. Next slide, please. Um, there are five cases here of other liability decisions from the year that you may find of interest. Um, what we'll do is we'll email my slides out at the end of the presentation to all of you. One of them, Jenkins, Abby, will be returning to in the next slot. Let's move on to those less fortunate than ourselves, a dear old Oliver Twist type of case, DJ Barnsley. And we're gonna move from liability good and proper to vicarious liability. This is one of three decisions on vicarious li liability that's come out this year, which show one, as with house prices, the advance of the doctrine appears to have stagnated, but two, and more usefully on a practical front, how the court is now approaching and applying the two-stage test to vicarious liability, which no doubt you'll remember is stage one, whether the relationship between the tortfeasor and the defendant was one that is akin to employment or employment itself, and two, whether the tortious action was sufficiently closely connected to that relationship, such that it's just and reasonable to impose vicarious liability. So let's go to the facts of DJ. Um, DJ was a nine-year-old boy. He was fostered by his aunt and uncle. He was very sadly abused by his uncle. And so he sued the local authority saying that they were vicariously liable. At first instance, it was held that the relationship between the uncle and the local authority 
was not akin to an employment relationship. And so the claim failed at stage one. So it was an appeal. And on appeal, it was said, look, the question to be asked in this case was whether there was a sufficiently sharp line between the activity of the foster carers and that of the local authority, such that vicarious liability was not justified. There's reference to the case of arms, you may remember from five or six years ago, where a local authority was liable for the actions of foster parents not related to the claimant. But there's discussion there, an ongoing discussion, because in this case, obviously, the foster parents are related to the claimant. So in this case, it was said the issue is not resolved simply by looking at the relationship between the claimant and his aunt and uncle. Rather, the distinction would lie in understanding the details of the relationship between the aunt and uncle and the local authority to see whether, when it was whittled down, it could be said to akin to an employment relationship. Now, in favour of that imposition of liability was the fact that the local authority were under a duty to provide care for the boy. They discharged that duty by placing the boy with the aunt and uncle. The aunt and uncle actually had to apply for the role and there was some form of risk assessment and interview through the process of them being appointed. The local authority would monitor the aunt and uncle to a degree and review DJ's welfare. And there was some form of agreement between the local authority and the aunt and uncle, at least at the very smallest, with regard to what contacts the boy would have with his birth parents. So that was in favour, quite a long list. Against was the fact that the aunt and uncle hadn't been recruited by the local authority as foster carers and hadn't been trained. Rather, the aunt and uncle had become DJ's foster carers because no other member of the family would look after him. So they took him in and then they became the foster carers. And what the court said is given that there were factors for and against an employment relationship, it was necessary to consider the balance of policy reasons underpinning why one imposes vicarious liability. And in particular, the test was to consider whether the aunt and uncle's care for the boy was integral to the local authority's business or sufficiently distinct from it such that there should be no vicarious liability. And in this case, the court said that the most revealing point was the fact that they had become carers of the boy because no other family member would. He was their nephew. Strongly suggests that they raised him because he was part of their family. And so it was held that actually the stage one test akin to employment wasn't satisfied. When looked at the detail, the activities in the aunt and uncle was more aligned to that of parents raising their own child than akin to that of employment with the local authority. And so the claim failed. So that's the first of the three decisions. The other two decisions, one of them is called the Trustees of Barry Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses against BXB. Next slide, please, Andrew. Now, that was where there was a member of the congregation who was ra raped by an elder of that congregation, uh, then having become friends through the church. And the facts of it were that the rape occurred at the home of the elder where the victim and her husband had been visiting after having done a morning of door-to-door -door evangelism. So the claimant quite understandably tried to hold the church vicariously liable for the actions of the elder. Now that claim in fact failed on appeal it was said, look, the duties of the elder, next slide please, Andrew, were akin to employment. So we got over the first stage because the elder was carrying out work on and behalf of and assigned to him by the church, performing duties to further the church's aims and objectives. But the case failed not on stage one, as our previous case did, but on stage two. There wasn't a close connection. Yes, it had been committed at his home, um, but it was committed in the context of the claimant being at the home to offer emotional support to the elder in the context of a friendship, not while the elder is acting as an elder. So that's the second case. And the third case is MXX, which is an 18 year old who's doing work experience at a secondary school. He subsequently makes Facebook friends with a 13 year old pupil and that friendship then becomes sexual. And it was said, look, the work experience placement was akin to employment. So stage one is satisfied but the close connection test wasn't. It was only a one week placement. Um, the work experience chap had had very little contact with the pupil during that week. The activity that occurred took place many weeks afterwards, so it wasn't just to hold the defendant vicariously liable. What I would say is have a look at those three cases. I think they are quite helpful in showing very clearly now
how the courts will deal with vicarious liability moving forward. As I've said, I think it's clear that there's been a pause in how far the doctrine advances, but this shows us how the courts are applying the evidence to the two-stage test. Right, let's move forward. Let's go to Iceland to be particularly wintry. Not that Iceland, Andrew, but this Iceland. This is a case where the applicant, which was Iceland, applied for permission to bring contempt proceedings against the claimant. The claimant sent a claim notification form to Iceland saying she tripped over a sack in the aisle. Iceland looked at the CCTV and saw the claimant pass this sack in the aisle twice, then come back and then appear to lower herself to the floor by it. So they told the claimant solicitors that was the case, this was fraud. Um, unsurprisingly, the claimant solicitors drew their necks well back in and ceased to act. So Iceland applied to the court for permission to bring contempt proceedings. Now, at the hearing, no one turned up on behalf of the prospective claimant, Birch. But the court set this, which is quite helpful, that when considering whether to grant permission to bring committal proceedings, one, the threshold required a strong prima facie case. Two, it had to be satisfied it was in the public interest. And when considering the public interest, the strength of the evidence of falsity was relevant. The maker's knowledge of falsity was relevant. The circumstances in which it was made and the maker's understanding of that effect of the statement and the use to which it was put. And the court has to justify the use of resources of court time in having the committal proceedings as well as the overriding objective. The court had a look at the CCTV and agreed that there was a strong prima facie case. And this is helpful. They said, look, there was a legitimate public interest in deterring others from making dishonest claims designed to elicit payments, jeopardize the administration of justice and waste court resources on illegitimate claims. Just note that last point. Yes, there is a use of court resources in having the committal proceedings, but if it can stop other fraudulent claims being brought, it will save court resources on those unnecessary trials. Next slide, please, Andrew. Finally, Latvia. Now, this is a case brought by, on behalf of a protected party, and it's an approval hearing. The facts were that the settlement sought to be approved involved periodical payments order of about 16,000 a year, British pounds. And of course the damages would need to be paid in British pounds, but then converted because the claimant was Latvian and would live in Latvia. So how does one index it properly? Well, the proposal was to index it to the Latvian monthly wage index. And the court says, yes, no, that makes sense because it best insulates the claimant against fluctuations and volatility in the currency markets, but also for the prospective growth of the Latvian economy and therefore wages in that country going up. Final slide, please, Andrew. On here are four other quantum decisions. I perhaps might direct your attention to the case of D, that's an interim payment application where the defendant produced very little evidence um, to rebut the claimant's evidence on causation. Breach had been admitted, but there was issues of causation. Um, and the court looked at it and said, well, no, you don't answer the claimant's case on this. The interim payment was granted. And then Barry, I direct your attention to that. This case came out in the spring, disability case. Claimant was clearly disabled by view of noise-induced hearing loss, but it didn't really affect his capacity to work. Um, the court held that actually when one looked at the reduction factors for dealing with the future loss of earnings claim, yes, on the but for one would take the non-disabled and on the as a result one would take the disabled. On both, the court would take the employed basis because the claimant had pretty much been in consistent employment ever since the incident. And the court said, look, don't be too ready to mess around with the reduction factors for employed claimants. Because actually from the statistics that we rely upon, the contingencies other than mortality, most of the claimants that are in employment are towards the moderate and mild end of the bracket of disabled, not at the severe end, because if they are at the severe end, they'd be unemployed. So the court says, look, we're not going to take the midpoint between the disabled and non-disabled basis. That wouldn't be appropriate. But what the court did is that uh, they said, look, strictly speaking, the claimant is level two, which is NBQA level sort of level. But we're going to treat the claimant as if he's got a degree, not because he has a degree, but because 
the effect of his noise-induced hearing loss is so minimal that actually an adjustment to treating him as if he had a degree and therefore was more employable is better. So the as a result contingency factor was re increased from 0.45 to 0.56, effectively an 11% increase. Have a look at the end of the judgment because there's quite a helpful discussion on what the Ogden table guidance notes actually mean when is one is considering how to deal with someone who is disabled but that disability doesn't really affect their employment too much. And that is it. Those are my cases. Next slide, please, Andrew. We've looked, therefore, at fairground rides, Christmas drinks, those less fortunate, Iceland, Latvia, and some other cases. I'll send out my slides later. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to uh, move on to do a clinical negligence update. Um, in the course of my talk, next slide please Andrew, um, I intend to talk about the big issues of 2023 as I've identified them, that is the uh, developments in the law of consent and also the uh, muddying of the waters in respect of the principle of novus actus intervenians. And once I've done that, um, I was going to briefly look at what I perceive to be the hot topics in clinical negligence for 2024. Starting then, previous slide please, Andrew. Oh. Um, starting then with the principle of consent, um, we obviously all are very familiar with the landmark decision in Montgomery, in which uh, a change in approach to the law relating to information disclosure was justified by reference to changing societal values and a shift towards a doctor-patient relationship based on partnership rather than paternalism. It was held that the standard of information disclosure was to be set by the court rather than she treated as a matter of clinical judgment. And as a result of that decision, the paternalistic approach of Dr. McKellen in informing Mrs. Montgomery or not informing Mrs. Montgomery of the risk of shoulder dystocia on the basis that it might lead her to request a cesarean section, which the doctor perceived to not be in her maternal interests, was an approach to information disclosure which could not be justified. Next slide, please. The court imposed obligation in respect of information disclosure is set out at paragraph 87 of Montgomery. I'm sure that is um, etched on all of our minds because it is something that comes up very frequently. And just to remind everybody, the doctor is under a duty to take reasonable care to ensure that the patient is aware of any material risks involved in any recommended treatment and also of any reasonable alternative or variant treatments. The paragraph then goes on to discuss how the test of materiality is to be applied. Next slide, please. Following Montgomery, th there was a bit of a fallout. Um, clinicians were asking what the obligation to disclose reasonable alternative or variant treatments meant in practical terms. And lawyers were asking who decided which of the theoretically possible treatment options were to be classed as reasonable treatment options. <clears throat> Five years later, uh, the Supreme Court in another Scottish case uh, answered those questions. Um, in McCulloch, the patient had died following a diagnosis of suspected pericarditis. The treating doctor, supported by her peers, formed the view that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs were inappropriate. The claimant, however, argued that he should have been given that treatment option. The drugs were clearly a possible treatment option, but the question was whether they were a reasonable treatment option and um, whether that issue was to be determined by reference to Volum or not. In summary, the Supreme Court drew a distinction between possible treatment options and reasonable treatment options. They explained that the narrowing down of possible treatment options to reasonable treatment options was found to be an exercise of professional judgment to which the professional practice test should apply. In other words, when looking um, at the menu that was actually offered to the claimant in terms of the treatment, uh, reasonable treatment options, um, the BOLAM test applied, um, albeit with the Belivo gloss. 
The court went on to explain that once it had been decided what the reasonable alternative treatments were by applying the professional practice test, the doctor was then under a court-imposed duty of care to inform the patient of those reasonable alternative treatments and of their material risks. The court emphasised that the, the, that the doctor cannot limit his discussion to the treatment option which he prefers, but instead he had to inform the patient of all reasonable treatment options using the professional practice test. And the court also explained that the doctor cannot reject an option by taking on himself a decision more properly left to the patient. And one can perhaps imagine that that might be particularly relevant in cases relating to cosmetic surgery. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the question of what was a reasonable treatment option was further considered um, by Mr. Justice Ritchie in CNZ. It was explained in the context of that case that back in 1996, it was not usual practice for a woman to be given the option of a caesarean section antenatally in the context of an uncomplicated twin birth. However, if the mother requested a caesarean section, that would be discussed. They would be counselled against it. But if they persisted in their request, a caesarean section would ultimately be performed. The defendant argued against that backdrop that an elective caesarean section was not a reasonable option. As it happens, as a matter of fact, it was found that the claimant had in fact asked about caesarean sections, she had been counselled about caesarean sections, and he, she had agreed to a vaginal birth. Nevertheless, um, Mr Justice Ritchie considered over to what the position would have been had that not have been the factual finding. And he found the defendant's approach to be illogical. Uh, so far as he was concerned, an elective caesarean section must have been a reasonable option um, because if the maternal request had persisted, the doctors would in fact agree to, have agreed to it as a birth plan. And indeed, they were performing caesarean sections in 42% of twin births. As a result, in his view, the practice of not discussing the option unless raised was contrary to Montgomery um, and therefore is an example of uh, the uh, menu of options being put to the claimant being um, unreasonable uh, by reference to the Balaam test uh, with the Belive gloss. Next slide, please. Previous slide. <clears throat> the case CNZ then went on to consider consent in the intrapartum context. The first twin had been delivered successfully vaginally, and then there was a late descent of the second twin. At that point, the options were caesarean section or artificial rupture of membranes. Those options were not communicated to the mother, despite both mum and dad requesting a caesarean section in the labour room. There was a six and a half minute delay in delivery, and much of that delay was generated by the registrar not ascertaining the patient's wishes before discussion with the consultant, and also preparing the transfer to theatre slowly instead of quickly. It's noteworthy that Montgomery was applied in the context of an imminent delivery rather than antenatally, uh, because that is different to the approach in previous cases. For example, in ML, uh, Martin Spencer explained that there was a world of difference between a woman who requests a caesarean sec section in the antenatal period and a woman who requests a caesarean section in the throes of labour pain. Uh, in the latter situation, uh, consideration has to be given as to whether it is a serious request or whether it's a cry for help in respect of the pain. In CNZ, Mr Justice Ritchie acknowledged that uh, Mr Justice Spencer's words were indeed wise, wise words, uh, but felt that Montgomery uh, applied albeit with a recognition of the different circumstances of the labour ward versus antenatal counselling. Uh, in CNZ, he felt it was particularly relevant that the father was there and able to speak for the mother. Um, and it was also relevant uh, that the mother made clear that she wanted a caesarean section uh, just nine minutes after the conversation should have taken place. <clears throat> Finally, when dealing with the issue of consent, uh, consideration had to be given as to whether the Montgomery decision, which related to events in 1999, um, applied to CNZ, which related to events in 1996. 
Um, and the answer to that question was that it probably did, um, thus pushing the uh, decision in Montgomery um, back potentially to the uh, mid 90s. Uh, next slide, please. That moves, uh, moves me away from the topic of consent and onto the topic of neighbour sanctus intervenience. It's quite common in personal injury cases um, for the amount, the level of injury to be complicated by uh, negligent medical treatment. Typically, in those cases, if liability is admitted, uh, the advice would be to pursue the original torpedia on the basis that they're jointly and separately liable for the whole of the damages which have ensued. And typically it was thought that the only exception to that would be if the hospital's negligence had been so grossly negligent as to have broken the chain of causation. Uh, the claimant could therefore pursue their claim against the personal injury defendant and the personal injury dependent, if so advised, could bring contribution proceedings against the hospital um, after the claim had settled. Uh, that, I think it was thought, worked reasonably well, and it probably um, saved cost and complexity in the long run. The decision in Jenkinson, however, uh, casts doubt upon whether that analysis is a correct analysis, where uh, personal injury claim has been complicated by medical negligence. In Jenkinson, the claimant had badly fractured their ankle in a tripping accident. The defendant's expert had criticised the hospital's management of the situation, and the defendant applied to amend to allege that negligent treatment broke the chain of causation. At first instance, the uh, district judge found that there was no reasonable prospect of success on the amended claim because there was no suggestion that the negligent treatment broke the chain of causation. Uh, there was no suggestion that the negligent treatment was grossly negligent and therefore broke the chain of causation. Uh, on appeal, um, the it was said that there was no special rule that medical negligence, medical treatment of an injury caused by a defendant's tort could not break the chain of causation unless it was grossly negligent treatment, so as to be a completely inappropriate response to the injury. Um, this implies that the question of what um, level of negligence will break the chain of causation is um, sort of more nuanced and more complex than has perhaps previously been advised. Um, and previous advice I know is in line with um, what the commentators in Clark and Linsell have um, recorded. As such, uh, the court permitted the amendment. Um, of course, in that case, it is only um, an amendment to pleadings. The defendant has only established that they have an arguable case that the negligent treatment broke the chain of causation. Um, but they haven't succeeded in that argument as yet. But nevertheless, the um, uncertainty as to um, whether the degree to which negligent treatment will be sufficient to break the train of causation may mean that more cases um, get passed to clinical negligence departments from personal injury departments, because, of course, the personal injury department is concerned that if they don't involve the clinical negligence lawyers, they could end up in a situation where the claimant is undercompensated because the court concludes that the uh, consequences of the medical negligence are not something which should lie at the door of the personal injury tort visa. Um, it's unclear whether that decision is uh, right or helpful or whether going forwards it's going to be treated as a bit of an anomaly. Uh, the original rationale behind Webb and Barclays Bank was that the tort visa should anticipate the possibility of dodgy medical treatment. And as I say, it's obviously good for claimants. Um, and it appears to have been working uh, reasonably well as a, a way to manage litigation. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, previous slide. Um, moving forward then, um, just looking at what might be the hot topics for 2024, we have the case of Paul and Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust. Uh, the Supreme Court decision is awaited in that matter. It relates to secondary victim claims um, and in particular whether it 
whether um, a claim can be brought in respect of a horrific event which has been witnessed in circumstances where the horrific event is removed in time from the negligence. For example, where the negligence is not performing a scan um, and the horrific event witnessed is a collapse some months later. We are awaiting the Court of Appeal decision in Lewis Ranwell. Uh, that is a niche but interesting claim relating to the illegality defence. Uh, the claimant has claimed for um, damages as a result of poor psychiatric care, which led him to commit a killing spree. It's clear that had the matter have gone to trial and had he have been found to be guilty of manslaughter, even by diminished responsibility, the illegality defence would take effect and he wouldn't be able to claim. In this case, however, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty owing to insanity. Um, and the question is whether the illegality defence applies in that circumstance. The claimant was successful at first instance. We are expecting further developments in the law relating to material contribution. Um, in both CNZ and CDE, uh, an injury had been caused by negligent and non-negligent hypoxia. Um, and the question was whether the functional effects of the negligent period of hypoxia were capable of being apportioned um, or whether the uh, claimant was entitled to claim damages for the whole of the injury sustained. Uh, CDE was a case where at first instance it was found that there was um, no non-negligent period of um, no negligent period of hypoxia, but on appeal, the appeal court found that there was a one minute period of hypoxia. And accordingly, that one has been reverted back to the first instance judge in order to determine what the effect of that one minute period of negligent hypoxia was. Um, in CCC, Mr. Justice Ritchie um, issued a certificate for a leapfrog appeal that was in the context of a lost years claim relating to a young child. The present situation is that um, young children who are seriously disabled cannot bring a lost years claim because of um, Croke and Wiseman, which said that there was no prospect of a future dependency relationship such that the award was inappropriate. Whereas uh, teenagers and adults can on the basis of, a, basis of Pickett and Gamel, and um, Pickett and Gamel doesn't uh, require there to be the reasonable prospect of a dependent relationship. There's therefore um, conceptual uncertainty within the law, which Mr. Justice Ritchie felt was right for the Supreme Court to consider. Um, so it remains to be seen whether the Supreme Court take up that opportunity. And then finally, um, we are anticipating a review of the discount rate. Um, the up-to-date position, as I understand it, with that is that the call for evidence has not yet been initiated um, and the 180 day review period has not yet commenced and therefore we're unlikely to see any change in the discount rate prior to autumn 2024. That concludes my summary um, of the clinical negligence um, update and I am just checking the chat box to see if there is anything there which I don't think there is. Um, if anybody has any any questions please do um, do let us know and we'll deal with them. Um, otherwise, I think it falls to me to um, wish everybody a happy Christmas and the best wishes of the season. Absolutely, and thanks very much for attending today.